this evening where um, our text is taken from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4. Uh, our, we're going to be looking mainly at verses 14 through 16, but I'd like to read uh, just the whole chapter in context. Certainly, it is uh, always beneficial, it's always helpful to read the Word of God, and uh, we are never actually, um, uh, I should say, subjected to uh, the, uh, well, the Word of God more than simply when we read the Word. Uh, the Lord preaches to us most purely when the Word is actually read. So let's just read this chapter together, Second Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Paul writes, therefore, since we have this ministry... As we received mercy, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you. But having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believed, therefore also we speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Uh, why was Paul willing to go through the things that he went through? It's because he saw what was ahead. He saw with the kind of faith that is necessary, um, those things which are ahead, he saw those things to be real and lasting Whereas the things of this world and also the sufferings he was going through were only temporary. And they were working for him rather than against him to produce the glory that was ahead. That's why he was willing to suffer the things that he suffered. Because he saw what was unseen. And when we ask ourselves the question, why is it that we should be willing to die to ourselves and to pick up our crosses and live for Christ, uh, why is it except that these things are also ahead of us. And the Lord promises to give them to us. If we will simply follow him, it is worth it. Now, as you know, last week, as you've already heard, we broke ground on a very important principle in Scripture. And that is that if we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have, in fact, died with him. Uh, Jesus not only died vicariously on the cross, which means he not only took our place on the cross when he died, but he took our place in every part of his ministry. Uh, when he obeyed, he obeyed in our place, and we obeyed in him when we trusted him. When he died, he died in our place, but we died with him. When he was buried, we were buried with him. And when he was raised, we were raised with him. Uh, Paul applies that in Romans chapter 6 to remind us that when he died, we died with him 
to sin. We died to, uh, with regard to ourselves, we died to ourselves. Uh, we stopped uh, living, as it were. The old man died, and the old way of living, and the old desires, and everything else. We were buried, and then we were raised again with him to newness of life. Now, no longer to live for ourselves, but to live for him. Now, that has happened in principle. It's a reality in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as Jesus is seated in the heavenly places because we are united with him by faith, the Bible says that we also are with him, seated with him in the heavenly places. Uh, in a certain sense, as Paul says in Romans chapter 8, we're already glorified. It's already a done deal because we are united to Jesus Christ. Now, but as we look around, we see that that's true in principle, but not in reality yet. I mean, we're still living on the earth. We're still not perfect. We're not in heaven seated with him, uh, except in principle. It is something that will come about. It is the the already, you might say, but there's still the not yet. There's still the, the journey between here and there that we have to make. Uh, and even though we may have died with him to sin and been raised again to righteousness, it doesn't mean that the struggle is over with regard to, to our sins. We still do have a struggle. We are not yet perfect. The fullness of these things is reserved for heaven, which means that as long as you are on this earth, you are going to struggle because there are two desires that are present within you. Sadly, uh, there is the desire to sin, the desire to spare your sin, to nurture your sin, to strengthen it, and to rebel against God. That's the old man still exerting his life in you. But there is also, thankfully, the new desire, which desires to put that sin to death and to live to God. That is the result of your death with Christ and your resurrection with him again to life. That struggle is going to go on throughout your life all the way until the end, until you finally arrive in heaven, which is why the Lord calls you in Scripture to put off the old man, consider him crucified, consider him dead, and to put on the new man, which is being renewed in the likeness of the Lord. Now, as you think about these things, as you set out to do these things, you need to realize, as well as I, that you're not going to do these things unless you have the proper motivation. Now, thankfully, you already have that motivation within. I mean, the Lord has already put his spirit in there. He's the one that gives you the desire to do these things. And yet, there's still that principle of encouragement that we need in Scripture and all the reasons why God has given to us to pursue these things, which, of course, the Spirit uses as he works within us to move us in that direction. Edwards reminds us, uh, Jonathan Edwards, in his book, The Religious Affections, that nobody does anything that they don't want to do, unless, of course, they're forced to do it. We choose the things we want to do. The affections and the desires of the heart are what actually lead us to make the choices that we make. And if we didn't have any of these desires, if we had no desires at all, Essentially, we would become paralyzed. Now, one of the reasons why you can become paralyzed with regard to the Christian faith is because you lose sight of the kind of motivation that you need to pursue these things. And it can be for one of two reasons. Uh, you may have no motivation for these things because you don't have the Spirit of God, because your heart hasn't been changed by the Spirit to love the Lord and to trust in Him. That's the case, of course. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But also, if you have been changed, your faith can be so weak that your love is weak, and it really can't move you to do very much for God's glory or for the good of your soul. You need motivation. You need that uh, work of the Spirit to be strengthened within you so that you will be drawn out after these things. Now, what is it? Well, there are actually many things, but... What should motivate you to put off the old and to put on the new? What should move you in that direction? Why should you be willing to deny your flesh and yield yourself fully to the Spirit? Why should you be willing to give up the things that you might otherwise gain in this world to seek for the things that are above? Well, I think the first to answer that question, again, there are many, comes from our text this evening. 
because the things that you are looking at in this world that you might place great value on, these things are all going to come to an end. And eventually, they're going to be worth less than nothing. While the things that you can see, the things which are spiritual and the things that are eternal, will last forever. And in the end, are going to prove to be far more valuable than anything you could possibly imagine. I mean, we really just have a, a very cloudy or impure or dim sight of what these things really are. If we could see them more clearly. I think they would move us much more powerfully. Now, in our passage, Paul is addressing those who are struggling with these, very, with these issues under a particular affliction. Actually, he's encouraging himself, too, because from what I've just read, it appears that he and those with him are suffering more. We're the ones who are dying, but you're the ones who are living. We're the ones who are suffering and decaying outwardly. But yet he realizes the Corinthians in their service for the Lord are going to have to go through exactly the same thing because in the world you will have persecution. And you know that life is only temporary in this world. But especially when you're under affliction and when you've been where they are long enough, you can begin to ask this question. Is it really worth it? Is it really worth giving up what might otherwise be a comfortable life to suffer, to suffer in the way they were suffering uh, for something that you can't really even see, something that is still a long ways off? Is it really worth it? Well, Paul says it is. Now, he says it's true that choosing the path of life will produce suffering. It will cause the outer man to suffer. But he also says the inner man will be renewed by God's spirit in the image of Christ day by day. Now, that's really a subject for another day, but it's an important thing for us to look at. But he says walking this path also means that you will lose some of your comforts and that you will have to endure some affliction, but the glory that is going to be revealed is so much greater that they will really should be considered even now as light and easy in comparison to that glory. Now, how could Paul say that? How could he say that to them? And more importantly, how was he able to live in the light of these things? I mean, to live this reality, especially considering the degree to which he suffered in his service to the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, he goes on later in the book of 2 Corinthians to give a catalog of everything he endured because of his service to the Lord because of his belief that these things were ahead. How was he able to do these things? Well, again, he tells us in our passage in verse 18, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The things we can see, everything that we see around us now, this building and chairs and even all the comforts we have in this world, the best things that you might be able to gain, they're, they're all temporary. I mean, they're, they're not only temporary for you because you're only going to be able to hold on to them while you're alive in this world, but they're temporary in general. The people who are going to receive them after you're gone are someday going to lose them as well, and someday all these things are going to be destroyed. But the things which can't be seen with the human eye the things which God promises those who will die to themselves and will live for him, those things which are ahead are things which are eternal. Now, for you to be willing to pay the price that Paul paid, you must be able to see what Paul saw through the eyes of faith and be convinced that what the Bible says is true, that it's not a myth, it's not a legend, it's not some kind of cleverly devised fairy tale that you're not merely hoping for something that's never actually going to come to pass, it's not going to happen, but something that is real. Now this evening, I want us to consider a couple of things. The first one is how important it is that you be convinced that the Bible, what it says, is true. And secondly, how you can be more certain or more convinced that it is. First of all, it is important, I hope you can see it's important to this principle that we're talking about, dying to self and living to God, to be convinced that what the Bible says is true. That um, you, 
Well, well, because of what, what you see, what you believe to be real, is going to have a very profound impact on your life. Now, we ask this question, why are there people like Paul? Why are there people like um, others in the New Testament that were willing to give up their comforts and to endure so many things in their lives to follow the Lord while there were others who were not willing to follow him at all? Well, it's because they saw what could not be seen with the human eyes. I mean, why, for instance, was Noah willing to spend, and again, we realize Noah lived to be, I think, into his 900s, probably one of the last to, to live so long. But he spent 100 years of his life building an ark. And the reason why he did that was because God had warned him that there was a flood that was coming. He was able to see what could not be seen because the flood had not yet come. And because of his faith, he was willing to work for 100 years building a boat while the rest of the world was continuing to live as though nothing was coming. Now, why was Abraham willing to pull up his roots, to leave his home and his relatives and to go to a country he had never seen, except that he could see that this is what God had for him and there was a place that the Lord was going to bless him. He was looking for that city, the Bible tells us, whose maker is the Lord. Moses gave up the comforts of Egypt. He could have had a very easy go of it, but rather he gave those comforts up, he gave up those riches in order that he might suffer with God's people. And why did he do that? Once again, because he understood what God had intended for those people, and he wanted those riches rather than the riches of Egypt. Why in the uh, book of Hebrews do we read that some were willing to wander in deserts and to live in caves? Why were they willing to be tortured and beaten and imprisoned and stoned to death, sawn in two, put to death with a sword, rather than just to throw in their lot with the world and avoid all these things? Why were they willing to go through these, these sufferings and even death? Why were the disciples willing to give up their homes and their families and their livelihood to follow Jesus, even though it meant that they would be hated by the world? Why were the martyrs willing to, um, well, basically to be willing to be thrown to the lions? Again, think about the ways that you might want to go. I mentioned this morning that uh, as you think about uh, being burned at the stake, as an example of what hell might be like, I mean, that pain was temporary, but I think all of you would, would cringe at the idea of being burned at the stake. I said being drawn, drawn and quartered would be my second, uh, the second way that I wouldn't want to go next to being burned at the stake, but being eaten by lions would definitely be at the bottom of the list as well. But they were willing to be thrown to the lions and to be eaten alive rather than to give up the scriptures rather than to offer a pinch of incense to Caesar and say, Caesar is Lord, rather than to deny the Lord Jesus Christ. They would much rather die at the, at the uh, mouths of these lions. Why were these willing to make such great sacrifices when there are so many today who will hardly, even those who claim to be Christians, hardly inconvenience themselves in any way for Christ? If Christ gets in the way of my fun, I shake my fun over Christ. Well, one of the reasons why they would do this, and certainly not the only one, is that those who were willing to make these sacrifices could see something that perhaps others can't see, something that is so precious that it's worth any price that they might have to pay in order to gain it. Now, what has to happen before you are going to be willing to give up your sins and to give up this world and to put on Christ and to seek the things that are above rather than the things below. You have to see the same things that they saw. You have to see those things. If you can't see them, if you're not sure that those things are real, you're not going to be able to give yourselves fully to these things and to let go of the world and to let go of your sins and to seek the things that are above. Let me ask you this question. Are you really certain that heaven exists? That there is a place of eternal happiness? That the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are actually there waiting to receive you and to bless you for the rest of time? 
If you're not convinced that that's true, then you're not going to do what's necessary to seek after those things. There's always going to be some doubt, something that holds you back, some, something that makes you wonder, if I let go of what I have now, if I let go of the things that I think are going to bring me happiness, am I going to lose my only chance at it for something that really doesn't exist? Am I going to lose it all for nothing? Well, to the degree that you doubt the truth of these things, to that degree you are going to be crippled from seeking after the kingdom of heaven and serving the Lord as you should. Your hearts are not going to be fully engaged in the things of the Lord. Again, this is just one obstacle. There's many. We need to see these things. We need to see them as they saw them, certainly as real, as the things that... that uh, well, that, that are the most important things. The things that we see now are temporary, but those things are eternal. Now, this brings us to the second point, and that is how can you see these things more clearly? How can you see them the way they saw them and know that they're true? And how can they have a greater impact on your life than they do currently? Well, there's really only one way, only one thing that can do it. And that is, of course, faith. Remember what the author to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. How can you be assured that these things are real? Faith. Faith is that assurance. How can you have the conviction that these things that cannot be seen are real? Again, faith is that conviction. Faith is what allows you to see the reality of what is not yet here. Faith is what takes God at his word and believes what he says and knows that what he says is true, that what he promises is actually more real than the things around you. When your faith is strong, that's exactly how these things appear. You will see these things as things which are not only worthless, but temporary. And you will see those things that are ahead of you as so real that you can almost touch them because they are real. So in order to see what these saints saw, you do have to have faith. You do have to believe God. You have to know that he is and that he would not lie and that he is not only real and the things that that he promises are, are real, but also that he is faithful, that he will do what he has promised that he will do. Now, how can you have this kind of faith? Well, if you've never trusted Jesus before, the first thing you need is to be born again. Without the Spirit's work, you really will never be able to see these things with the kind of certainty that you will need to have to let go of the things that you see in order to pursue the things that you don't see. Now, I do believe that the Bible says that you can believe to a certain degree that these things are real without the Spirit's saving work, but you will never see them to be as real as they have to be to you to be willing to pay the price that is necessary for you to actually gain these things. So if you've never trusted the Lord before, you do need to ask him this evening to grant to you the grace, the gift of the Holy Spirit who alone can open your eyes, not only to see your need of Jesus Christ, but also to see the kingdom that he promises those who trust him and those who will serve him. So if you don't see it and you're unconverted, only the Spirit of God can give you that sight, the kind of sight that you need so that you will say, it's worth it and I will give up everything in order to follow him. You'll have that same kind of heart as the man who found the treasure in the field. Jesus says in one of the parables, who sold everything that he had in order to possess that field so he could have the treasure. You'll be willing to give up everything to obtain the pearl of great price. That is the kind of a value that those who see the kingdom of heaven place on the kingdom of heaven, they're willing to give up everything that they might have it. And again, giving up everything, as you know, by now doesn't mean that you strip yourself of all possessions and hit the road in order to 
preach the gospel or something like that, unless, the Lord, of course, the Lord calls you to do that. But it means that you're willing to see yourself as you really are, which is a servant of the Lord and a steward of his possessions, and that you use all those things, your position, your relationships, everything you have to glorify God and to advance his kingdom. It all belongs to him, and none of it really belongs to you. You're only a servant. You're only a steward over his possessions. You have to see the kingdom of heaven for what it is. Not only see its reality, of course, you have to see its value. That's another principle that we want to look at, that before you can see its value, you have to see its reality. And really, to see both of those things, you need the Spirit of God. You'll never, you'll never be willing to pay the price otherwise. But if you have trusted Jesus, then you already have the Spirit of God in your heart, and you can already see the kingdom. And you already know of its value. Because again, Jesus says that really no one can be his disciple who's not willing to give up everything to possess the kingdom. So if you possess the kingdom, if you're a Christian, you already see its value. You're already willing to give up everything to do this. However, because of the struggle that goes on in your soul between the old man and the new, between the flesh and the spirit, you don't see it the way you need to see it. It's a struggle to see it that way. It requires work. Your vision needs to be sharpened. And for this to happen, you need a stronger faith. And the only way that I'm aware of that you can have a stronger faith, and I hope you're aware of it by this time as well, there's no magic bullet. You know, there's no, uh, as it were, magic promise in Scripture that if you just see that and you pray this particular prayer that God's going to open up you know, the windows of heaven and show you these things. Sometimes we think that's the way the Christian life is. I just need to pray this prayer and God's going to bless me with this. That's not the way it works. Although prayer is certainly involved. You have to use the means of grace. There's no substitute. If you're not spending time in prayer, and I don't mean just you know for a few moments before a meal, but actually seeking the Lord in prayer privately, with your spouse, with your family, with the body of Christ, when they meet together for prayer, if you're not being faithful in your worship of the Lord, again, privately or publicly with the people of God as they meet, if you're not reading the Word of God with faith and meditating on that Word, if you're not meeting with God's people for fellowship, to be built up with the gifts that the Lord has given to your brothers and your sisters, then you're going to be perpetually crippled by your sins and by the world because you're not going to have the vision that you need. You're not going to be able to see the things that you need to see to draw your heart out after these things. You're going to be partially blind. Your eyes are only going to be partly opened. And because of that, you're going to waste a good amount of your life on things that really do not matter at all in your pursuit of happiness, in your pursuit of pleasure. You have to see the kingdom of heaven. It has to be at the center of your life. It has to be what gives you pleasure so that that is what you're going to be seeking after. So basically the first thing that can help motivate you to do what it is you need to do, to put off your sins, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, the first reason why you should be willing to let go of this world and to follow after Jesus for the rest of your life is that the alternative, the things that you think are so important, the things you think are so pleasurable and so much fun, the things that you think you have to have to be happy, these things are only temporary. And whatever you think that you're going to gain from these things, you're going to lose. In the end, they're not going to do you any good after this life is over, you cannot take these things with you. They're not going to be of any value to you in the place in which you were going. If, you, you know, if you're a believer in heaven, the things that you seek after for pleasure in this life really aren't going to help you at all. But the kingdom of God is forever. And whatever you invest of your life into that kingdom, Whatever you invest of your time and of your talents and of your resources into this, 
that is permanent, that will be forever, that is something that will actually, you'll be able to hold on to for the rest of time. Not to mention the blessings it brings on this earth of absolute peace of mind that your future is secure. We can't forget about just the subjective element of assurance. If I'm pursuing the things above, I'm gonna have a much stronger assurance than if I'm pursuing the things of the world. The kingdom of heaven is that which I love the most rather than the world. That's going to do a lot to build up your assurance that you are the children of God. So having that assurance on earth, that peace on earth, and knowing that you're storing up treasures that you're going to be able to enjoy forever, that should be worth any price that you have to pay for it. It is worth it. And so... Use the means of grace. I guarantee you that if you spend time with the Lord, uh, spend more time with Him and more earnestly, if you seek the Lord, read His Word and meditate on it. If you pray, seek after the Lord. If you meet with God's people and you seek the Lord with God's people, if you meet with the people of God and worship and you give yourself to worship and you praise and honor this God, he will give you more of his spirit, and you will see these things to be what they really are, which is more real than the things of this world. You will be able to get the world out of your heart and out of your eyes and set your heart on the things above. You will want to kill your sins because they're going to get in your way, and you're going to want to nurture your desires for the things of the Lord. In other words, it's sort of what we call a vicious circle when we do things that are wrong. It just keeps spiraling down, becoming worse and worse. But there's also a virtuous circle. The more you do it, the stronger you get. And that's what the means of grace will do for you as you seek the Lord. And so use the means of grace faithfully. And you will have a stronger conviction that you are not wasting your time on things that really don't exist you will see that they really do exist and that giving yourself to them is the wisest possible use of time. Well, may the Lord help you, may he help me also, may he help us all to see this truth so that we don't waste any more of our precious time pursuing things that are worthless, but rather will make the most of our lives for God's kingdom and ultimately for our eternal well-being by seeking the things that are above. Unless we can see these things and desire these things the way that Paul did and others who have gone the same path, we're never going to be able to live the kind of life they lived. We're never going to be able to deny ourselves and give ourselves to the Lord's work as we should. We will be ensnared by the things of the world. They will cripple us. They will hold us down. Don't let them do that. Don't waste your time on those things. Don't give your heart to those things. Be freed from those things by pursuing the Lord and getting a clear vision of the kingdom of heaven and its value. And may the Lord help all of us uh, to be able to do that. Let's spend a few moments in prayer and ask the Lord to apply his word to our hearts as we need to hear what he has told us this evening.